Welcome to Medisagas, Tales in Medicine. This is Liam, your narrator for these incredible stories that were researched and written by physician and author, Dr. Rod Tanchanko. Prepare to be captivated by tales of perseverance, serendipity, medical misadventures, and the endless quest to conquer diseases. If you love history and true medical drama, then you're in the right place. Thank you for listening. A lump in the breast. It is a discovery that evokes anxiety, panic, fear, and probably a host of other emotions. It could be nothing. Maybe it will just go away. Can it be treated? Will I need surgery? These and many other thoughts swirl in heart-pounding succession when patients first feel, oftentimes by accident, that ominous, abnormal lump. Perhaps Abigail Adams Smith experienced the very same emotions and thoughts when she first felt a lump in her breast. Her family called her Nabby, and she was the 46-year-old daughter of John Adams, the second president of the United States. The year was 1810, and she was living with her husband, Colonel William Stevens Smith, in the recently established and mostly wilderness central New York town of Lebanon. Her parents, John and Abigail Adams, lived 300 miles away in Quincy, Massachusetts. As presidential families go, the Adams were probably one of the most copiously documented. The massive amount of correspondence written and received by John and Abigail Adams to and from family, friends, allies, politicians, and other prominent figures of the day has filled volumes of books. John Adams, by this time, had been out of official politics, his term as president having ended 10 years prior, following his defeat to Thomas Jefferson. He and Abigail had been spending their retirement in the Quincy farm and continued to correspond with political allies and friends. Abigail described their relatively quiet life at the farm in one of her letters to her son. You will find your father in the fields, attending to his haymakers, and your mother busily occupied in the domestic concerns of her family. In 1810, Abigail was already 66 years old, and John was 75. They were not in the greatest of health, as could be expected for older folks in the early 19th century. Abigail complained of intermittent fevers, aches, and pains. And John was bothered by arthritis, poor eyesight, tremors, and loss of teeth, making it difficult to understand his speech. Both suffered from a rather common ailment called rheumatism, which pretty much covered all the aches, pains, stiffness, and other general symptoms that the elderly were prone to experience. But they remained mentally sharp and very much attuned to what was happening in their young country. And there was quite a lot going on between 1800 and 1810. The population had grown to seven and a quarter million citizens, a rise of 25% in 10 years. The U.S. had doubled in land size after Louisiana was purchased from France in 1803 when Thomas Jefferson's was president. Exploration and expansion followed as Lewis and Clark ventured to the West in their two-year Corps of Discovery expedition. The nation's capital was now situated along the Potomac River in a small village called Washington. The area was described as swampy, as in literally swampy, with unpaved dirt roads and very few amenities. The Capitol building was still under construction and did not have its famous dome yet. The White House, or Executive Mansion, as it was then called, was also under construction. Most Americans lived outside the few cities that existed. Most of them depended on farming or activities tied to agriculture for their livelihood. And that takes us back to Lebanon, New York, where our main character, Nabby Adams Smith, was living with her husband, Colonel William Stevens Smith. They moved there in 1807, and William had taken up farming after he engaged in a series of disastrous investments and career missteps. William was supposed to be bound for a very promising career. After a distinguished service in the Continental Army and working directly under Washington, he then served as secretary to the American legation in England. In that role, he worked under John Adams, who was then the United States minister. It was during this stint in England when William and Nabby met. A romance blossomed over the ensuing months. A love-struck Nabby wrote about the dashing young colonel. His society has enlivened every scene for last 12 months. 
cheerfulness and good humor he has ever promoted, in short, all that my fondest wishes could paint, as lovely and engaging, the more I reflect upon it the more I am satisfied. They got married in London in 1786. Two years later, they returned to the United States. William's next roles included assignments as U.S. Marshal of the District of New York, and in 1800, his father-in-law, then President John Adams, appointed him as Surveyor of the Port of New York. During this period, they lived in the town of Jamaica, in Long Island. The couple would be blessed with four children, and William's endeavors obliged him to travel back and forth between New York and London. Unfortunately, he was not quite as astute a businessman nor politician as he had hoped to be. His failed investments in land and shipping ventures eventually drove him to financial ruin. An ill-fated affiliation with a Venezuelan revolutionary whom he attempted to support only led to his being fired by President Jefferson. And so in 1807, William and Nabby settled in Lebanon, New York, where William tried his hand at farming and worked to salvage his finances, career, and reputation. William's financial miscalculations, his long absences during which he did not write regularly to Nabby, and the embarrassment he caused the Adams weighed heavily on their marriage. Nabby's mother, Abigail Adams, was worried about her daughter. In a letter Abigail to her sister, she wrote, I had a letter on Saturday from Mrs. Smith. The colonel returned last week and has notified his creditors to meet him in order to adjust with them his affairs. I cannot suppose that he has it in his power to satisfy the demands they have. But if he can settle so as to be able to do any business in future, it will a great relief to my mind as well as to hers. In her letters, Abigail referred to Nabby as Mrs. Smith and William as the colonel. She went on. It really seemed to me at times as if Mrs. Smith would lose herself. She has sometimes written to me that existence was a burden to her. I have been more distressed for her than I have been ready to own. You know she always kept everything to herself that she could. And in that snippet, we see a glimpse of what Nabby was like. She was known to be reserved, pensive, pragmatic, and preferred to endure difficulties quietly. Certainly not a rabble-rouser or the rebel type. When she was 19, she wrote in her journal, Saturday, 27th. Mama desired me to be dressed. She was going out to make some visits. I obeyed. I seldom resist commands, however my will may be for it. We can only assume what she must have thought when she first felt that lump in her breast. Surely the worst scenario came to mind. People were well aware of cancer and what it meant. If she felt a sense of panic, she probably made a point of not showing it. Maybe she kept it to herself for a little while. If she went through a period of denial, that would have been a perfectly normal reaction. It's conceivable that the need for surgery crossed her mind. And if it did, there were many reasons to be fearful. This was the early 19th century. There were no anesthetics, no antibiotics, no antiseptics, no fancy hospitals. There were certainly not a lot of trained surgeons and people relied on town healers, herbalists, or themselves for medical treatments. And if one were to require surgery to face that fearsome knife, well, that would strike terror in anyone. And when it came to breast cancer treatments, the options were extremely limited. Hugh Monroe, a surgeon of the period, published a book with the exceedingly long title, A Compendious System of the Theory and Practice of Modern Surgery, Arranged in a New Nosological and Systematic Method, Different from Any Attempted in Surgery, in the form of a dialogue. Regarding the treatment of cancer at that time, he wrote, No medicine has been as yet discovered that will cure this affection. Various remedies have been recommended such as arsenic, secuta, hyoceamus, and many others, which injure the constitution materially and are attended with very little effect. He was talking about herbal remedies like water hemlock and henbane, which are very toxic. In fact, water hemlock is listed as one of the most poisonous plants in North America. Nonetheless, they were used medicinally for pain relief, sedation, and treatment for other symptoms. Of course, None of them can cure cancer. The only method of cure is to remove the diseased parts completely by the knife. The author qualified this further by saying that surgery be performed. 
especially if the disease has not already made considerable progress, and if one part of the body only is affected. Removing a portion of the diseased parts seems to do an essential injury, as experience has discovered. No operation, therefore, for the removal of serous tumors is to be attempted, except when the whole of the diseased parts can be removed. It's clear that medical knowledge at the time recognized how critical it was to remove all the cancerous growths to give patients the best hope for a cure. The doctors also had some concept of metastatic disease. In the same book, the author advises that for breast cancer specifically, the surgeon must pay attention to the lymph glands in the neck and armpit areas, which may also be involved. By removing the diseased parts, by an operation, a cure is sometimes obtained. The state of the glands above the clavicle and those of the neck and axilla are to be particularly attended to. This suggested that even more extensive surgery was sometimes required, all with relatively crude instruments and no anesthesia. As you can imagine, the complication rates from bleeding, infections, pain, and disfigurement must have been very high. And there was really no reliable way to tell how widespread or advanced the cancer was so one can only guess how many surgeries were destined to fail. Going back to Nabi, she consulted with a local doctor, and indeed she was advised to try the hemlock treatments. She used a paste to apply to her breast, as well as a pill. Unfortunately, the lump steadily enlarged. In the early months of 1811, she wrote and told her mother Abigail, who mentioned Nabi's apprehensions in a letter to Louisa Adams, her daughter-in-law. My anxiety is great for my dear and only daughter. She is apprehensive of a cancer in her breast. I have besought her to come on to Boston and take advice, and I have consulted Dr. Welch and Hulbrook. They have advised as well as they could without seeing her, but wish her to come here. I cannot yet prevail upon her. She thinks that she cannot leave home without the Colonel and that he cannot come. But the real truth is, I believe, she thinks the physicians would urge the knife, which she says, the very thought of would be death to her. Abigail continued to press Nabby to come to Quincy and be seen by doctors in Boston. Nabby did relent and made the 300-mile trip in oppressive summer heat to Quincy. She arrived there with her daughter in late June 1811. Her husband William was not with her. It was the first time Nabby had seen her parents in three and a half years. Abigail couldn't be happier to see her daughter and granddaughter. I need not say how much rejoiced we were to meet after a separation of three years and a half. Mrs. Smith has gone to town today to consult Dr. Welch respecting her complaint which has not yet appeared to injure her health, although the appearance is alarming. The doctor's opinion was more encouraging than they had anticipated, and Abigail relayed the news to William. His opinion is that no outward application should be made and that Mrs. Smith's general state of health is so good as not to threaten any present danger. He does not pronounce it to be of the nature we feared. He advises to the use of the hemlock pills. By August, more doctors had examined Nabby. In addition to Dr. Welch, she was seen by Dr. Tufts, Dr. Warren, and Dr. Hulbrook, their family physician. While Dr. Tufts seemed to express some uncertainty, the consensus was to leave the tumor alone. Abigail wrote to William in late August. Dr. Tufts alone varies in some measure from them. He is at a loss as to its nature, but the result is by no means to do anything to worry or irritate the part. Would it not be best having advised with surgeons and physicians to follow their advice? Nabby was without a doubt much relieved at being spared from surgery. She planned to return to her home in New York in October. Sometime during her stay in Quincy, Nabby also reached out and wrote to a dear family friend, Dr. Benjamin Rush, for his advice. At the time, Rush was already an iconic figure. He was the only person with a medical degree to sign the Declaration of Independence. His actions during yellow fever epidemics, although controversial, were also considered heroic. And during his long career, he rose to be one of the most renowned physicians in the United States. Rush was very concerned about Nabby's tumor, and unlike the other physicians, recommended an aggressive approach. He responded through a letter dated September 1811 to Nabby's father, John Adams. I shall begin my letter by replying to your daughters. I prefer giving my opinion and advice in her case in this way. 
you and Mrs. Adams may communicate it gradually and in such a manner as will be least apt to distress and alarm her. After the experience of more than 50 years in cases similar to hers, I must protest against all local applications and internal medicines for her relief. They now and then cure, but in 19 cases out of 20 in tumors in the breast, they do harm or suspend the disease until it passes beyond that time in which the only radical remedy is ineffectual. This remedy is the knife. From her account of the moving state of the tumor, it is now in a proper situation for the operation. In other words, since the tumor was still movable and not fixed, it may still be localized and had not spread. Should she wait till it suppurates or even inflames much, it may be too late. And then recognizing Nabby's great fear of undergoing surgery, Rush offered some reassurances. The pain of the operation is much less than her fears represent it to be. I write this from experience having about two years ago had a tumor of perhaps a larger size cut out by Dr. Physic from my neck. I was surprised when the doctor's assistant told me the operation was finished. I repeat again, let there be no delay in flying to the knife. I sincerely sympathize with her and with you and your dear Mrs. Adams in this family affliction, but it will be but for a few minutes if she submits to have it extirpated, and if not, it will probably be a source of distress and pain to you all for years to come. It shocks me to think of the consequences of procrastination in her case. He couldn't have been more emphatic. Abigail and John trusted their friend and urged Nabby to follow Dr. Rush's advice. In mid-October, Abigail wrote to Rush, with a grateful heart, I address you to thank you for the earnest and decision with which you gave your opinion respecting the case of my dear daughter. She had consulted several physicians here, all of whom agreed on saying that if the tumor became discolored or inflamed, she must apply for surgical aid. With this opinion, she was preparing to return home. Your letter arrived, which instantly determined me to prevail with her if possible to submit to an operation. When William heard of this, he protested. Understandably, in a state of denial, he did not want Nabby to go through the dreaded surgery. It probably took some more effort on the part of Nabby's family to convince her as well, but in the end, Nabby and William agreed for her to undergo the surgery. Instead of heading home to New York, she had the operation performed on October 8, 1811, at the Adams home in Quincy. The surgery was performed by Dr. John Warren and his son, Warren was an accomplished professor of anatomy and surgery and a founding faculty member of the Harvard Medical School. Also in attendance were doctors Welch and Hulbrook. There were no records of the actual surgery. There are, however, some published accounts that describe the events in the room where the surgery was performed. One such account that seems to be often quoted was from the book Bathsheba's Breast, written by James S. Olson. With a good amount of detail, Olson described the surgical instruments and the events starting from Nabby's entering the room, quote, as if dressed for a Sunday service, unquote, to her being strapped to a chair and all the way to the final suturing and bandaging. What is often not quoted are Olson's sort of disclaimer when he wrote, quote, exact details of the operation are not available, but it was certainly typical of early 19th century surgery, unquote. And in the notes section of his book, he further clarifies that he used two sources to discuss Nabby's illness, and that, quote, The reader should also note that for narrative purposes, in describing the operation, I have generalized beyond the source itself, adding details about early 19th century mastectomies that were once common to most surgeries, but not necessarily to Nabby's, unquote. He italicized, not. We do know from one of Abigail's letters that Nabby's whole breast was removed, we also know from John Adams' letter to Rush that the operation lasted 25 minutes, but dressing the wound took an hour. John gave this account to Rush. The surgeons all agree that in no instance did they ever witness a patient of more intrepidity than she exhibited through the whole transaction. They all agree that the probability of complete and ultimate success is as great as in any instance that has fallen under their experience. Now, as a side note, if you are interested in an actual first-person account of a woman undergoing a mastectomy during this period, 
then consider checking the podcast notes for the reference for the letter written in 1812 by novelist Fanny Burney. But be warned, it is quite graphic. We can only imagine the torment that Nabby and any patient undergoing major surgery during that period went through. A few weeks later, in late October, William arrived in Quincy. By then, Nabby seemed to be recuperating well. Abigail again. Colonel Smith arrived here upon Sunday morning and was relieved to find Mrs. Smith had gone through the dreaded operation and to find her also so well. The wound has closed and healed. Her arm she is forbidden to use, keeps it in a sling. She is weak, but not more so than might be expected. By November, Nabby felt well enough and confident enough to go out and ride, only to realize that she had overexerted herself and ended up feeling unwell. A month later, it is now December 1811, her wound had completely healed, but she was still unable to use her arm. Everyone remained optimistic that she would make a full recovery. She cannot bear the motion of a carriage nor write a line herself, but we are encouraged to hope for a perfect restoration from time. Nabi would not be fit enough to travel back to their home in Lebanon for several more months and well into the following year, 1812. There were some good news that year. William had managed to repair his name and was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. This achievement would require him to be in Congress and away from home for considerable amounts of time. After settling back in their New York homestead, Nabby's condition deteriorated. She began experiencing terrible back and hip pains. She wrote to her mother that she was having severe attacks of rheumatism. Nabby was treated with a procedure called blistering, wherein an irritant was applied to the skin to cause blisters to form. The belief was that doing so would get rid of inflammation and stimulate healing. She also underwent bloodletting, another common practice that had existed for centuries. She underwent these procedures more than once. Not surprisingly, she became even weaker. Nabby knew she was suffering from something worse than a rheumatism attack. She noticed a tumor on her other breast. A local physician examined her and gave the grave prognosis. There was nothing that could be done. The cancer had spread. Nabby kept this to herself, trying to spare her family of more distress. Abigail found out in May 1813, after receiving a letter from a relative who knew of Nabby's worsening condition. Abigail wanted to travel to her daughter, but her own physical ailments prevented it. Nabby resolved to make the impossible journey to her parents' home. Traveling during the summer, in pain, in a carriage trudging over 300 miles of early 19th century roads, it took 15 days to reach Quincy. She was determined to spend her final days in her parents' home. Abigail could not believe how Nabby endured the trip. How in her helpless, debilitated state she had the courage to attempt a journey of 300 miles, I can scarcely realize. Nabby was emaciated and unable to walk. She described the pain in her abdomen as like it was enclosed in an armor. She was again evaluated by doctors, but their conclusions were the same. Abigail was despondent. I had flattered myself that her disorder was rheumatic affection, but that hope is extinct. Opiates were the only thing that afforded some temporarily relief. Three weeks after she arrived in Quincy, Nabby passed away, surrounded by her family. The following day, her father, John Adams, wrote a postscript in a letter that he had started a day before Nabby died. It was to his good friend, Thomas Jefferson. I can proceed no farther with this letter as I intended. Your friend, my only daughter, expired yesterday morning in the arms of her husband, her son, her daughter, her father and mother, her husband's two sisters and two of her nieces, in the 49th year of her age, 46 of which she was the healthiest and firmest of us all, since which she has been a monument to suffering and to patience. It's a tragic story, no doubt. And coming from a famous, well-documented family, 
Nabi's excruciating ordeal has been circulated and retold many, many times. In several ways, Nabi was more fortunate than most. She had access to the best physicians with the best skills and knowledge, proper connections and very strong family support. She was intelligent, well-informed, and received the best possible care. In a time when there was no recognized standard of care, no formal informed consent or established ethical standards, or rigorously regulated medical and surgical training, women in the same predicament and who were not as privileged were at risk not only of complications, but of inadequate information and lack of control over decision-making. But cancer does not discriminate. And Nabi's story provides a vivid view of a world from over two centuries ago. It hints of the ordeals of many untold stories. In John Adams' words, other monuments to suffering and to patience. That concludes this week's episode of Medisagas. We hope you found today's journey both captivating and enlightening. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing as well as leaving a review on your preferred platform. Also consider becoming a patron of this podcast. Come visit the website and send us your comments, suggestions, or ideas for stories that you want featured in future podcasts. We always appreciate your feedback and support. Thank you.